Hello, my name is Dr. Hannah Rosa. I'm a GP working in the northeast of England, and I also co-host the GP Notebook study groups. Welcome to the GP Notebook podcast, where we discuss bite-sized topics aimed at all those working in primary care. You can find us on all major podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. Please follow us to receive notifications about new episodes. And if you like what you hear, please consider leaving a review to help other listeners find us. You can also follow us on x at GP Notebook for more information about new podcast episodes and study groups. Finally, you can visit gpnotebook.com for podcast episode show notes and to find out more about upcoming study group meetings. In this episode, we will be discussing erectile dysfunction. To introduce this topic, I thought that I'd start with a case. Simon is 67 years old. He is a retired electrical engineer and reviewing his notes, he's just on amylodipine for hypertension. He's come to see you today to discuss his knee pain and at the end of the consultation with one hand on the door handle, he asks if he can have some Viagra on prescription. He's looked at buying it online but felt it was quite pricey. What do you say to him? It can be tempting to ask a few more questions, quickly check there are no contraindications and give him a prescription. However, this could lead to us missing a potentially serious underlying cause. And so, keen not to rush through the history, you ask Simon to come back to discuss this fully, which he agrees to do. This is a fairly typical GP presentation, and we will follow Simon's care as we progress through this episode. First, we will look at the definition of erectile dysfunction. Then we will go through the basic workup needed. Next, we will look at management and then when we should refer before finally thinking about what to cover at the yearly medication review. At the end, there'll be a quick quiz so that you can test your knowledge. So let's get started. Erectile dysfunction is defined as the persistent inability to attain and maintain an erection sufficient to permit satisfactory sexual performance. It is a symptom rather than a disease and it may be due to a primary organic or psychogenic cause, but most cases are a mixture of both. Let's look at the basic workup. When our patient Simon comes back to see us, what should we ask him? Should we do an examination? And which blood tests may we want to order? To start with, it's good to get a clearer picture of the problem. Finding out when the erectile dysfunction started, whether there was a trigger such as a new relationship or the birth of a child, asking if the onset was gradual or sudden, inquiring if it affects all erections or whether early morning or self-stimulated erections are still possible, seeing if he's already tried anything and whether it helped and if his libido changed. An organic cause is suggested by a gradual onset of symptoms, lack of tumescence and low to normal libido, whereas a psychogenic cause can cause a sudden onset of symptoms, low libido and often good quality self-stimulated erections. When you ask Simon, he discloses that it has been happening for the last five years or so. The onset was gradual with no trigger his libido is still much the same and that he struggles to get any erections at all. These symptoms make an organic cause the most likely for him and of these, vascular causes are the most common. These are associated with conditions such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia, peripheral arterial disease, diabetes mellitus, smoking and obesity. As well as the blood supply, The nerves controlling the penis can also be affected and central neurogenic causes include conditions such as multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease and stroke. And peripheral neurogenic causes include diabetes, chronic kidney or liver disease and pelvic or urological surgery. 
Other organic causes include hormonal causes, for example those related to diabetes, hypogonadism, hyperprolactinemia, hyper or hypothyroidism. And anatomical changes, such as due to Peyronie's disease or prostate cancer. Just a quick note here on prostate cancer. A population-based case control study published in 2006 found that the positive predictive value of erectile dysfunction leading to a diagnosis of prostate cancer was 3%. This places it higher than many other symptoms, including frequency, nocturia, hematuria and weight loss. At the end of the article, the authors concluded that impotence is an important and early marker for prostate cancer. An investigation for possible prostate cancer should be considered. Our psychogenic causes can be split into generalised causes, such as lack of arousal and disorders of sexual intimacy, or situational causes, for example, relationship problems, performance-related issues, or due to stress, depression and anxiety. What about medications, such as Simon's calcium channel blocker? Well, some antihypertensive drugs have been associated with erectile dysfunction, such as beta blockers and thiazide diuretics. But ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers and most calcium channel blockers are reported to have no relevant or even a positive effect on erectile dysfunction. Other drugs which may cause erectile dysfunction include antidepressants and recreational drugs including alcohol, heroin, cocaine, cannabis, anabolic steroids and opiates. Next, moving on to examination. Would you perform any examinations on Simon? Well, any examination is going to be focused on assessing for a cause and checking for any reversible risk factors. So assessing for a vascular cause, we should check Simon's blood pressure, heart rate and rhythm and BMI. If you're considering a central neurological cause, then doing a focused neurological examination would be useful. Whereas if you're suspecting hypogonadism, then checking for gynecomastia, sparse body hair and reduced muscle mass would be relevant. NICE also state that we should consider doing an examination of the external genitalia to assess for penile conditions or testicular abnormalities and a digital rectal examination to assess the prostate, especially in men over the age of 50 or in men with a previous history of prostate cancer, obstructive lower urinary tract symptoms or other symptoms such as prolonged ejaculation. And then the final part of our initial assessment, which blood tests would you order? Well, for all men, we should request a HbA1c or a fasting blood glucose, lipids so we can calculate a Q risk. And here note that erectile dysfunction forms part of the clinical information section in a Q risk 3. And finally, we should order a fasting serum total testosterone taken between 9 and 11 a.m. to assess for testosterone deficiency and hypogonadism. If the free testosterone level is low or borderline, then we should arrange for a repeat serum testosterone together with FSH, LH, sex hormone binding globulin and prolactin levels. Depending on the likely underlying cause and clinical judgment, we should also consider testing a PSA thyroid function tests, LFTs, eusinase and a prolactin. For our next step, we have management and there are four parts to this. Providing information, education on lifestyle, reviewing comorbidities and then the pharmacological treatment. For part one then, providing patient information. The NHS website has a useful page on erectile dysfunction that you could direct patients to or for a very detailed resource aimed at patients, the British Association of Urological Surgeons has a specially designed section on their website. I've put the links to both these resources in the show notes. Part two, 
We should advise patients about any lifestyle modifications that may help. This may include general advice, such as on smoking cessation, alcohol reduction, weight loss or exercise, but could also include more specific advice on cycling. If a man regularly cycles for over three hours a week, they could consider stopping cycling for a trial period. This is because regular cycling can cause erectile dysfunction due to compression of the pudendal nerves and arteries. For management step number three, we should optimise the management of any reversible or modifiable risk factors or conditions, such as diabetes, hypertension and dyslipidemia. If a drug cause is suspected, we could consider stopping the offending medication. And finally, step four, treatment. We can consider treatment with a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor or PDE5 inhibitor, such as sildenafil, irrespective of the suspected underlying cause. And the good news that we can tell our patients is that with these drugs, the success rate for helping men with erectile dysfunction to successfully complete sexual intercourse is around 60 to 65 percent. They are usually prescribed as one treatment dose per week. However, more than one treatment per week may be prescribed if required. The most important factor to consider is to review whether sexual activity is advisable, especially by assessing the cardiac risk. We should not use PDE5 inhibitors in patients who have a high cardiac risk. And this includes symptoms such as unstable angina or angina that occurs during sexual intercourse. Patients who have hypotension, a systolic blood pressure below 90, should also avoid PDE5 inhibitors. We should also not prescribe these drugs to patients who regularly or intermittently use nitrates, such as GTN spray, nicarandil or the recreational drug poppers. This is because the combination can produce significant hypotension, which can be fatal. So, if you see a gentleman in clinic with cardiac sounding chest pain, and you note that he takes a PDE5 inhibitor occasionally, how long should be left since he last took his last dose of this drug before you can safely give him the GTN spray? Well, at least 24 hours should have passed for sildenafil and possibly vardenafil, 48 hours for tadalafil, and at least 12 hours for avanafil. We also need to be cautious when considering prescribing a PDE5 inhibitor to patients who have an intermediate cardiac risk. A further drug interaction to be mindful of is the concurrent use of a PDE5 inhibitor with an alpha blocker due to the increased risk of postural hypotension. PTE5 inhibitors should not be used by men taking non-selective alpha blockers, such as doxazosin, unless they have finished alpha blocker dose titration and are on a stable dose. Now, let's look in more detail at the different PTE5 inhibitors. For these drugs to work, the patient needs to become sexually excited and the timings for how long before sexual activity these drugs should be taken and how long their effects last for varies. Firstly, sildenafil. Patients should take it one hour before sexual activity and the duration of action is four to five hours. In the UK, sildenafil can be bought over the counter as Viagra Connect. Tadalafil can either be used as required or daily, with the daily option being for patients who anticipate sexual activity at least twice a week. If taking it as required, then it should be taken at least 30 minutes before sexual activity and its duration of action is up to 36 hours. In the UK, the as required option can also be bought over the counter as Silalis together. Now, some of you may be thinking, but we aren't supposed to prescribe once daily to Dalafil. Well, in August 2023, NHS England removed once daily to Dalafil from the list of 
items which should not routinely be prescribed in primary care. Quoting that once daily Tadalafil is safe, effective, and its price is now comparable with the as required formulation. So review your local formularies as you will probably find that you're now able to prescribe it. Just as a side note, daily Tadalafil 5mg has also been approved and licensed as a monotherapy in men with BPH-related lower urinary tract symptoms. There are also two other PDE5 inhibitors available, which are Vardenafil and Avanafil. Another thing to bear in mind is that there is a large counterfeit market for these drugs. So if a patient is sourcing it themselves, check that they're getting it from a reputable source, especially if it isn't helping. With regards to side effects, they're common, occurring in approximately 1 in 9 patients, but only 3% of men stop treatment because of side effects. The most common side effects include headache, flushing and indigestion. Rarely dizziness can occur, in which case patients should not drive. And even more rarely, serious eye diseases can develop and patients should report any visual abnormalities promptly. A few tips that it's good to let patients know is that alcohol decreases the effectiveness of these drugs and eating a heavy or fatty meal before taking them decreases the rate of absorption, except for with Tadalafil. So ideally, patients should take them on an empty stomach or two to three hours after a meal. The British Association of Urological Surgeons have a great patient information leaflet on PDE5 inhibitors, which I've included the link to in the show notes. When it comes to the practicalities of prescribing, generic sildenafil can be prescribed without restriction on the NHS in England. Viagra, Tadalafil, Vardenafil and Avenafil are not prescribable on the NHS for erectile dysfunction unless the man has one of the specific medical conditions or previous treatments listed in the Selective List Scheme. These conditions include diabetes, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease and prostate cancer. For a full up-to-date list of all the criteria for England and Wales, please visit the NHS Electronic Drug Tariff, the link for which is included in the show notes. All of the patients will require a private prescription. With regards to other types of treatments, you may have heard of a Roxon Stim Gel. This can be bought over the counter and is applied to the head of the penis and the manufacturers state that as it evaporates, it produces a cooling effect And as the skin then gradually warms, the nerve endings become stimulated, which increases blood flow. Does it work? Well, it gets mixed reviews online. The reviewers on one well-known pharmacy website gave it 2.1 stars out of 5 at the time of recording. So, back to Simon. He agrees to have some bloods checked, and following the four management steps, he's given patient information advice on lifestyle, you've reviewed his comorbidities and he's keen to have a prescription for sildenafil. What would you do next? Well, NICE recommend that after starting treatment, we should arrange follow-up six to eight weeks later. And when you see Simon again, he's disappointed. The sildenafil hasn't helped. What would you do now? Well, NICE advises that if the drug treatment is ineffective, we should reinforce lifestyle advice and ensure that the medication is being taken correctly. NICE also advises that we should consider increasing the medication dose and asking patients to try it four to eight times at the maximum tolerated dose before switching. If taking Tadalafil, we could also consider switching to once daily rather than on-demand dosing. We should ideally trial at least two different PDE5 inhibitors before classing a patient as a non-responder, as limited data suggests that some patients might respond better to one PDE5 inhibitor than another. But if despite going through all these steps, the PDE5 inhibitors are still ineffective or they're not tolerated or contraindicated, 
then we should offer a referral to urology. Specialist treatment options may include vacuum erection assistant devices, using alprostadil in injections or via the urethra, vascular surgery or penile prosthesis. Thinking further about referrals, we should also arrange a referral to urology for patients with erectile dysfunction if the man is young or has a lifelong history of difficulty in obtaining or maintaining an erection, if there is a history of pelvic, perineal or genital trauma, if there is a penile structural abnormality or an abnormal testicular examination. If a diagnosis of hypogonadism is suspected or there are other abnormalities of testosterone, FSH, LH or prolactin levels, then we should arrange a referral to an endocrinologist. Also remember that a referral to mental health services, psychosexual or relationship counselling may be useful, or possibly a referral to cardiology to reduce a gentleman's cardiac risk. Okay, now for the final part, the annual review. Patients on a PDE5 inhibitor can use them long term if there are no contraindications or significant adverse effects. And reassuringly, there's no clear evidence that people develop tolerance to these drugs. However, men may become less responsive to them over time due to factors such as worsening atherosclerosis. We should also use this review as an opportunity to review any reversible risk factors and comorbidities, including trying to reduce the gentleman's risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke. Right, as promised, a chance to test your knowledge with a quick quiz. Feel free to pause the podcast after each question. Question 1. Angiotensin receptor blockers can cause erectile dysfunction. True or false? The answer is false. They may even have a positive effect on erectile function. Question 2. Sildenafil should be taken approximately one hour before sexual activity. True or false? The answer is true. Question 3. NICE advises that we should consider performing a digital rectal examination in patients with erectile dysfunction to assess for an abnormality of the prostate in four circumstances. What are they? The four circumstances are 1. If there are obstructive lower urinary tract symptoms 2. If the patient has prolonged ejaculation 3. If there's a history of prostate cancer and four, if the man is over 50 years of age. Question four. There are a variety of different blood tests that we can consider doing for men with erectile dysfunction, but which three should all men get? They should all be offered a HbA1c or fasting glucose, lipids, and a fasting serum total testosterone. And our last question, question five. Viagra can be prescribed without restriction on the NHS. True or false? The answer is false. It requires a private prescription unless the man has one of the specific medical conditions or previous treatments listed in the selective list scheme. Only generic sildenafil can be prescribed without restriction. How did you do? Thank you all for listening. I hope that you found this podcast helpful. Please do have a look at the show notes that accompany this episode at gpnotebook.com and we'd be very grateful if you consider following the podcast and leaving us a review on your favourite podcast platform. Feel free to get in touch via social media at gpnotebook or email support at gpnotebook.com if you have any questions, comments or ideas for future podcasts. You should also visit us at gpnotebook.com to register for our virtual GP Notebook study groups and download free shortcuts to help improve the lives of our patients in primary care. Right, I'm worried my husband has been doing too much cycling, so I'm off to hide his bike. Goodbye. (laughs) 